before we begin tonight's Bible study, let's uh, join each other in prayer, shall we? Father, how good it is to be together again uh, in the fellowship of believers. We come, all of us, from a world that is so far from you and is definitely against you. It's at enmity with you. And we come out of that, and it's so nice to be able to come into uh, your church and into the fellowship of believers where we can get that breath of fresh air, where we can be reminded of your holiness and your promises of your scripture and your faithfulness and as we can stir each other up to good works and love and how needed it is in this dark hour. And so, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your sanctifying work in each and every one of us. Thank you for the hunger that you've put in each and every one of us for your word. And may you fill that hunger tonight as we study your word together. Uh, may you also fill every cup that's here tonight to overflowing so that we're prepared and, and able and equipped to go out and serve you better in the world that you have around us. We thank you for this evening and for everything you do for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Psalm 43. Psalm 43. Last week we did Psalm 42. Imagine that. And Psalm 43 <laughs> is considered to be pretty much just an, an add-on. You could almost look at Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 as the same psalm. Um, you could almost say that they're one and the same uh, because you'll see some similarities between Psalm 43 and what we saw in Psalm 42 last week. Um, but you'll notice that there's a, a subtopic that says, send out your light and your truth. It's God's light and God's truth uh, that's being asked of here by the psalmist to be sent out. A very short psalm here, but lots to find from it. So let's begin. Verse 1. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man deliver me, for you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O oh God, my God. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. That's the entire psalm. And the first question we have in front of us is, what is the psalmist asking God to do in verse 1? Verse 1 says, Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. What's, what's the psalmist asking God to do in that verse? Send out your light and truth. Mm, that's not in that verse. That's in a later verse. Oh. But think of it. Think of it imagery. Godly people. Yeah. So if you had to put it into a, if somebody said, um, if somebody said, put this into a location, right? And that you, and I read that verse to you. I said, vindicate me, O God, defend my cause against an ungodly people from the deceitful and unjust man deliver me. Can you think of a location if you were a, a Hollywood movie producer and you had that one verse to go on and you needed to put it into a location? that best suited that verse. Can you think of a situational location that would fit the words vindicate, defend my cause? Is it a courtroom? Yes. Nice. Yes. This is a lot like the psalmist asking God to defend him in the courtroom, so to speak. Vindicate me, O oh God, I've been unjustly accused. Right? So vindicate me. You're the great judge. Show that I have been uh, unjustly accused, defend my cause against an ungodly people because they're deceitful and unjust. I need you to deliver me. So that's what he's asking him to do. He's saying, hey, God, deliver me, vindicate me. You're the great judge. Prove me free. Prove me right. Prove me innocent. Vindicate me. So that's what he's asking God to do in verse 1. And he's asking him to be vindicated against the ungodly People, those who are uh, unfaithful to God, those who don't care about God. So there's definitely a contrast there. What would this look like in your own life today? If, if you were to try and put yourself in the same situation, 
Can you think of an example of where you might pray something similar to God? Yes. Such as? Such as like a body of maybe. Mm -hmm. Family members. Yeah, family members who are unjustly accusing you or unjustly acting poorly towards you when it's not deserved, right? And so this would be a similar way that we would pray to God in that situation as the psalmist has done here. Hey, God, we're being falsely accused here. Uh, vindicate us. In the end, Lord, set all things right. We don't know, like, we don't know how you are going to do it because sometimes God allows the road to be rocky on purpose. And other times he smooths it out on purpose. And sometimes he does both. And sometimes his timing is quick and sometimes his timing takes longer to accomplish his good will. But we can ask him that, hey, judge us and vindicate us. We cry out to God to have our, our name cleared, so to speak. To vindicate us. Defend us against this deceit. Defend us against this. Deliver us from those who are unfaithful to you. It's good to ask those questions from time to time. Because we can get within ourselves, you know, and kind of forget that there's all these principles for how to deal with that. And I think everybody here has dealt with or is dealing with uh, family issues, family strife, family um, problems where there's a, a deep misunderstanding or a deep mistrust or pain or unresolved issues and so this is this is a good thing to take and not only put in your back pocket but pull it out and use it and pray this way god god doesn't waste a, anything so if it's in his word it's meant to be there so we can use this as a principle hey when we're being unjustly judged whether it's in the court of public opinion or whether it's in our own family you know who's going to defend me god will defend me so put your faith and trust in him in that situation, just like you do in larger situations like your very salvation. Trust in him to vindicate you, to save you, to deliver you. Any thoughts on that? All right, how about question two? What two things are happening at the same time in verse two? Verse two says this, For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? So there's two things going on there in verse 2. The psalmist has two different reactions, doesn't he? So what are the two different reactions that are found in verse 2? It starts out with one. He takes refuge in God, and yep. then he asks why he's rejected. Yeah. Uh, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> two totally different. But isn't that how we feel sometimes? where you'll acknowledge, you might have just finished praying a prayer about God vindicate me, God deliver me from this, you know, these attacks that are happening, you know, to me or to my loved ones. And this, this whole situation, Lord, is just such a messy bowl of spaghetti. I don't know how it's ever going to get untangled. Please have mercy. Untangle this. Restore, you know, our family. Restore my, uh, restore me in, in your eyes and in the eyes of my family. Do, you know, make a change. I take refuge in you, God. Oh, why are you so far from me? Why have you abandoned me? Why does it, why does it seem and feel like you're not listening? Uh, so the two things that are happening at the same time is, at the same time, the psalmist is acknowledging God as his refuge and his strength. And at the same exact time, he's lamenting that he feels as though God has left him. Yeah. So he, he, he's got both of these things. He's, he, he feels, he knows God, and he knows God is a, is a deliverer. He knows God is a refuge for him in times of trouble, because that's a refuge is a, a place of safety. You go to it when you're in trouble. So he knows God's a refuge, and he acknowledges that, but then he acknowledges how he's really feeling. In spite of knowing that God is a refuge, he's also acknowledging his, how he feels. He feels that even though God is a refuge, because of what's going on. It feels as though God has rejected me. It feels as though I go about mourning because my enemies are still there. The problem is still there. It hasn't been resolved yet. And so he's questioning that. Same way we do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And 
you know, that's why the second part of the question is, have you ever felt the same way as the psalmist does here? I think everybody yeah. has felt that way. Is it wrong to feel that way? Is it wrong to, to feel? Because the psalmist is acknowledging, I think, quite boldly, exactly how they feel. Is it wrong to do that? No. Because we're not perfect, and mm -hmm. God knows we're not perfect, and sometimes we just think that he's not with us, and there's a lot of it. And that would be, I think, the distinction. Take your feelings to God. Right. And I think there's a distinction to be made, an important one, that there's a difference between acknowledging your feeling, that it feels like God has abandoned me. There's, there, there's that. And then there's staying there, and then there's being reminded and reminding yourself of, of God's faithfulness and his promises. Where, where I think it turns sinful is if you stay there. If it's constant doubt, and if it's constant dejection and rejection and a constant feeling of dread that God has abandoned you and he's derelict in his duties as a father to you, and why am I still feeling this? So you, you know, like if it stays in that realm, that, I would say, is sinful. But to merely express your feeling of, God, I know that you're a refuge and a strength, but you feel so far away from me. And that's what we acknowledged last week in Psalm 42, was that, this psalmist is, is writing and saying, I feel like I'm in the deepest part of the ocean where there's just, it's the deepest part. So to be there without a boat, I'm sinking. I feel like I'm fighting against the waves and I'm, at any moment I'm just going, blah, 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 you know. And so he's acknowledging that. And then right after that, he, he says, oh God, you're my refuge, my strength, my salvation, and, and my God. And so he's just acknowledging those feelings. I think it's, it's healthy and normal to be able to acknowledge those feelings. And then what you do with those feelings is you're validating them, but then you're making sure that you're bringing them to heal to what God's objective truth is. And so you don't allow your feelings to dictate truth, but you validate your feelings. I can say that right now I feel like God is, is abandoning me, but I know that that's not really true because he says he'll never leave me nor forsake me. He says he indwells me. He says that he, the Holy Spirit is a down payment, right? Until a seal upon me, until he brings me home. Um, I know that anyone, uh, like in John 10, no one can snatch me out of God's hand. I know all these things. And so, because I know all those objective truths, the subjective feelings are secondary. They don't matter. So, you want to validate feelings, but then you want to take them and push them through and observe them, or maybe test them is a better word, using God's objective truth. So then you can correct those feelings. I feel this way, but I don't have to stay feeling this way because here's what God's word says. And that's an, that's an important exercise. Um, there's a, a term that I heard years ago uh, called misbeliefs. And there, there can be some very powerful misbeliefs that we allow to stick around. One of the analogies that I've used for it is you think of an army base, right? An army base has a big fence around it, right? And they don't let any, just anybody in. You've got to go through the guard, the guard post. So when you go up to the guard post, you're grabbing a big old truck. Boom, 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 boom. And you get to the guard post, and if the guards are doing their job, they inspect the truck, right? They make sure you are truthfully who you say you are. They check the truck to make sure the truck is truthful and that everything's good, and then they allow it into the base. Well, you can imagine your mind and your heart are a lot like that base. And so you, can, you have to guard what you allow to come into your heart and into your mind, just like that base. And so you're, you have to have a very active guard post so that when a thought comes in, um, God doesn't love you. You're still in pain. God doesn't love you. That thought comes in. So it's a truck coming up to the to the guard post. Bum, 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 bum. Hold it right there, right? So then your guard post should check that thought out using scripture and say, wait a minute, this truck on this big side and big lettering that says God doesn't love me. What? I'm like, that doesn't pass the scripture test. Get out of here, turn around, get this junker out of here, right? That's, that's how it's supposed to work. So then you're guarding yourself against any of those misbeliefs. So then, but if it pulls up and it says, Sometimes I feel like God doesn't love me, but then I remembered Scripture says otherwise. All right, come on through. Right. 
And so you actively are always taking all your thoughts and doing this, a similar thing. You're always taking them and you're always going to use that, that metaphor, that illustration, and to guard your heart and mind. Because you can imagine, you, you know, allowing that kind of stuff through, it adds up after a while. It adds up after a while. And then what you're really doing is you're, you're dishonoring God because you're putting more faith and trust in your feelings than you are in God and his word. And so we know that's not true. We know that's not right. So we want to make sure that we're always doing it that way. And that's why I think it's good to, to acknowledge how you feel. And then when you do that, it allows you to, to use that, that metaphor of the guard tower. And say, you know, I'm gonna, this guard post is going to stop this thought and these feelings, and it's going to examine them closely against Scripture. And if it's scriptural, I'll allow it through. And if it's not scripture, I turn it away. And you can only do that, though, if you acknowledge how you're really thinking and feeling at the moment. But that's a good, and that's why you can see why that would mean that knowing your scripture would be vastly important. Because then you're better, you have a better uh, group of soldiers at your check post, at your guard post, if they know scripture. If they don't know anything about anything, they're going to let everything through. Sure, it looks good. Come on in. Sure, sounds fine. Come on in, you know. But if you know scripture really well, well, then your guard post is really strong. They know the difference between truth and falsehood. That helps you too. All right. Question three. According to verse three, what is it that the psalmist is asking for? Verse three says, send out your light and your truth. truth and let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and your dwelling. So there's some imagery used there. What is the psalmist really asking for when he's asking God to send his light and his truth? What's the, what's the equivalent of that? If I say, if, uh, if I feel as though I am in darkness, and I ask God to send his light and his truth, what am I asking him to do? The flashlight. <laughs> yeah. Show me the way. Give me some direction. Open my eyes. Yep. Yep. Guide me. Open my eyes, help me see clearly your light and your truth. Again, at the very beginning, he was asking God to vindicate him. In truth, he knew that there was nothing, that he had done nothing wrong. So he's asking not only for light, but also truth. So guide me, Lord. And then he has another part here. He says, let them lead me. So let your light and your truth lead me and let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. What do you think that is referring house. to? House. And where, in this time when the psalmist was writing this, what would be considered the house of God at that time? Temple. Yes, very good. Very good. In Psalm 42, there was reference to the temple. Reference to the psalmist saying, I want to go back to the time when I was in the temple and I was worshiping you, and the people followed me into the temple and worshipped you. And there was talk of that, right? In Psalm 42, that's what the psalmist was referring to. Oh, I want to go back to the time when I was marching into the temple and the people were behind me and we were praising you and worshipping you. I want to go back to that time where I feel like I'm in your presence. I have a thirst for you. And I long to be in your presence and I long to praise you. That's, that's what he's talking about. So send out your light, send out your truth. Lead me, guide me to your dwelling place, to your holy hill, to your temple. If he gets what he's asking for, what does he expect to happen? The altar of God? Yeah. So if he, if he we, I've kind of already said it. Right. If he gets there to the temple, if, if, he, if God gives him light and gives him truth and leads him to his holy temple, right, and sets everything right and straight, what does he expect he'll do if that happens? Save him. What's that? Save him. Save him. But then because he saved him, he'll, his, re, his reaction to that will be glorifying joy. glorifying joy, worship, yep. Yep. Because that's the whole point of the, the temple is worship. So if he gets what he's asking for, he expects to go to the temple and worship God because of the fact that he saved him, he delivered him, because he gave him light and truth, because he vindicated him, all those things. (laughs) 
we'll have a this will this next portion here will prove that even more true here question four what does verse four mean it says then i will go to the altar of god to god my exceeding joy and i will praise you with the lyre O oh god my god what's he what's he saying there he's going down to verse three mm -hmm. praise him in his song yeah yeah he felt one way prayed about it god answered that prayer and then the result of that is, again, worship. He goes to the place where God is. He goes to the altar because that's where you go to offer up worship. And that's what he does. And he has exceeding joy. Not just joy, but exceeding joy. And again, he acknowledges God as his God. You do all these things, Lord, and I'm going to have such exceeding joy. I'm going to go to your altar. I'm going to worship you. And this is a public kind of worshiping because this isn't just like, I'm going to go to my secret place and I'm going to worship you. No, this is a very public, you know, it's in the temple. He's going to praise him with the lyre. He's going to, he's going to make a, a spectacle of his worship and praise of God because of what God has faithfully done for him. Question five. What's happening in verse five? And does this verse sound familiar? Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. This, this is another one of those instances where we just went from lament to praise to lament, right? I mean, he just got done saying, oh, when you answer my prayers, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the temple. I'm going to go to the altar. I'm going to worship you with exceeding joy. Why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him my salvation and my God. What, so what do you think is, what's happening there? In that he picked the wind out of his sables. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it, right? I mean, he, he's, gone, he's gone like this, right? When he's down in the depths of despair, he, he talks about how he's just, my enemies are all around me. Why have you abandoned me? Then he reminds himself of, of God's faithfulness, and then now he's back up on the mountaintop. And then something else happens, and he's down in the valley again. And then he reminds himself of God's faithfulness, he's back up on the mountaintop. By your rhythms. Yeah. And he, so then he, he is, he's going to, this is the same refrain that he's, the reason it sounds familiar is because this is the same refrain that was, re, was repeated several times in Psalm 42. Mm -hmm. And what he is doing is he's, he's chastising himself. You know, why? 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 I know the truth about God. So why is my soul cast down? Why is my soul within, within me in turmoil? Why? My hope is in God, for I shall again praise him. So even within verse 5 itself, you have the lament and then the hope. At the, in, in a, just in one verse. And that kind of says the whole story of Psalm 42 and 43, a lament and a hope, a lament and a hope. And then again, it ends on a lament, but then ends finally on a hope. God doesn't leave you in lament. He leaves you in hope. And so when he says, he's chastising himself, I know better. Why am I cast down? Oh, my soul, why are you in turmoil within me? Instead of having that reaction, he's talking to himself. Instead of all that, I should hope in God. Because I shall again praise him. What, when he says, I shall again praise him, what's that another way of saying what? If I say, uh, Michael, quit being such a, a, a doubter. Don't, don't be so full of anxiety and stress. I can put my hope in God. Better days are coming. He's going to act at some point. I shall again praise him. At some point, he is going to do something to which I will again praise him. I'm, I'm not going to, when I say that, I don't, that's, that's like terminology that means you're not staying where you're at, right? You're not going to be in the same situation. At some point, God is going to act and move, and he many times is acting and moving behind the scenes that you can't even see. It's under the surface. But at some point, you shall again praise him. So you're feeling like you're in turmoil, you're feeling like you're abandoned, you're feeling like you're surrounded by enemies, but... Put your hope in God because you will again praise him. 
you will again at some point see what he has done to vindicate you, to save you, to deliver you, and that will result in your worship and praise of him again. Better days are coming. The end of this trial and tribulation is coming. And you can, you can really see that not only in your day-to-day -day lives, but also in just speaking in long-term, spiritually speaking. Even if you have a, a very difficult life, that will end at some point. And like Romans 8, 18 says, that you know, what you endure now compares not to what awaits you in the life to come. So even if you have to wait until that moment, you will again praise him. And then he goes on to say, my salvation and my God. It's a great way. When I feel uh, down, when I feel downtrodden or despair-filled or just weak, weary, battered, bruised, I remember that my hope is in God. I remember that this too shall pass. And I remember that he is my salvation and he is my God. And all that is the counter, that is the medicine to that ailment. Any thoughts on that? So if you, if you are ever in that situation, that's a formula you can use. Uh, Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7 is another formula you can use. You feel full of anxiety? Well then, guess what? Pray. That's what God says. Pray. Pray with thanksgiving and supplication, and the, the peace that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's, I mean, it's a formula for how to deal with anxiety. This is a formula on how to deal with when you're feeling like the psalmist feels here. Abandoned, forgotten, turmoil, enemies surround you. What about question six? What situations in your life does Psalm 43 remind you of? How did God respond and use your own situation? Anybody have anything they'd like to share there? Well, I go back to the Bible and Randy saying that he's just taken it, taken it from me. And I don't even really think that much about them anymore. Mm -hmm. And when you do, I think it's like it does happen where like it's, it's a grace when it doesn't happen as much as it used to or when he gives you peace about it. But when it does come up, do you do similar things where you pray, you remember who God is, that he is the one who's in control, and that he is your salvation, he is your God, your hope is in him. Would you all say that that is your MO, that's your go-to move if you have something similar in your lives going on, that you would do that? You have another solution, a better one. <laughs> there is no better one, right? I mean, what are you going to do? Tell me, put your hope in something other than God? I mean, there's not a better solution. We didn't, putting your hope in God is, is, is also to put your hope in his word. So then to take his word and apply it to whatever situation that you have going on in your life. And to rightly apply it. So that if it's something regarding uh, forgiveness, you apply God's word of it to, to that. If it's something regarding church discipline, you, have, you apply God's word to that. If it's something regarding uh, parenting, you apply God's word to that. If it's something applied to uh, husband and wife, you apply God's word to that. Children re rearing, you apply God's word to that. That is another active way of putting your hope in God. If God says this is the way that you do this, it's the same. You want your church to thrive? It's not going to thrive if you're not doing it God's way. Right? If your hope is in God, then your hope is in the things of God, which would include his word. So then you want to do every, you want to submit every part of your life to God's word, putting your hope in God that his word is true and that if you do things his way, that you'll be blessed and not cursed, that you'll do well in the land and not suffer, that you'll be in the best position possible instead of the worst position possible. Any other thoughts on any of this? Well, you guys did so good. That's it for Psalm 43. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Not much to it. It's funny how I can say there's not much to it, but there actually is quite a bit to it.